Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about a decree that President Putin has issued taking control of assets that are owned and operated by European countries. Now, this isn't the first time that Russia has taken control of assets from overseas companies. But what is interesting about this latest development is that both of these overseas companies were continuing to operate the assets as normal. So these companies hadn't taken the decision to exit Russia entirely. They were happy to carry on with the commercial relationship despite what's going on in Ukraine. However, despite this, President Putin has stepped in and taken ownership of these assets. And I think this is a really interesting development because it's changing up Russia's approach. President Putin is taking a far more aggressive stance and seizing ownership of what he sees to be key assets. So in today's video, we'll go through the details of the decree that's been issued taking over these power plants. We'll go through the detail of the assets that are owned and operated by Uniper, the German energy company, and Fortum, the Finnish energy business. We'll then go on to have a look at the list of the companies that are still operating in Russia. Yale University are keeping a running total of all of the European and international businesses that have exited Russia and all of those who have deliberately stayed on. So we'll look at which companies are still operating happily in Russia and which assets are at risk. We'll then have a quick look at the cost to the global economy that exiting businesses in Russia has cost Western companies. And heads up, spoiler alert, it's over $1 trillion. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think the implications of this latest decree that's been issued by President Putin are, and what's likely to happen with regards to the Russian economy and the global economy. Now, before we get started on all of that, I wanted to remind you that the first Joe Blogs live stream event is taking place on Wednesday, the 3rd of May. And if you'd like to join in that, if you'd like to see me back in the Joe Blog studio, giving you my views and opinions as to what's going on in the global economy and generally chewing the fat, then please have a look in the description below where you'll find links to my Patreon page and YouTube membership. On Tuesday the 25th of April, President Putin of Russia signed a decree establishing temporary control of the Russian assets of two foreign energy firms, signalling Moscow could take similar action against other companies if need be. The decree outlining possible retaliation if Russian assets abroad are seized showed Moscow has already taken action against the German business Uniper's Russian assets and the assets of the Finnish energy business Fortum. The decree said Russia needed to take urgent measures to respond to unspecified actions from the United States and others it said were unfriendly and contrary to international law. The shares in the two entities have been placed in the temporary control of Rosimus Chevo, the federal government property agency, the decree said. Rosimus Chesvo said more foreign firms could find their assets under temporary Russian control. The agency would ensure the assets were run in accordance with their importance for the economy. Russian media agency TASS reported that the decree does not concern ownership issues and does not deprive owners of their assets. External management is temporary in nature and means the original owner no longer has the right to make management decisions. Now, interestingly, both Uniper and Fortum have stated that they would like to dispose of the assets that they hold in Russia. And asset sales by investors from unfriendly countries, as Moscow terms those that have imposed sanctions against Russia following its invasion of Ukraine, require approval from a government commission and in some cases the president. So despite the fact that Russia is stating that this is only a temporary situation and that ownership could be returned to Uniper and Fortum in the future, it's highly unlikely that that will ever happen. There is absolutely no business case for Russia stepping in and taking ownership because both of these companies have continued operating the power plants as normal. So there's not been any disruption to the services, but Russia is really taking a political step here to step in and say, if you're thinking about selling these assets, we're going to seize ownership and effectively take control and nationalize these businesses. Now, before we go on any further, I want to talk to you about today's sponsor, Masterworks. As we're discussing in today's video, Russia's invasion of Ukraine has had a monumental impact on the investments made by Uniper and Fortrum in Russia. And trying to find a balanced portfolio of investments at times when market conditions are volatile is challenging. 
and 2022 saw the worst performance since 2008 for the stock market. And Goldman Sachs have recently stated that the market is heading nowhere in 2023. As a result of this, fund managers are now looking into low correlation assets because even if markets flatline this year, these assets can continue to climb. And according to a recent report by Citibank, of these assets, the one with the lowest correlation is art. Now, you may be thinking that art as an investment is only available to billionaires. However, Masterworks has come up with a creative structure that lets you invest in multi-million dollar paintings without breaking the bank. And since Masterworks started trading, they've built a track record of 11 exits, all of them profitable. So in view of these dynamics, it's no wonder that Masterworks has seen over 650,000 investors trying to gain access. And as a result of that, there is now a waitlist. Now, I want to make it very clear that I'm not providing investment advice. And before you make any investment, you need to do your own research. However, if you are interested in investing in Masterworks, then Joe Bloggs viewers have exclusive VIP access to their latest offerings, which you can check out by clicking the link in the description below. Unipro is the Russian subsidiary of German energy company Uniper and is listed on the Moscow Stock Exchange. And the market capitalization of the business is currently around 134 billion Russian rubles which equates to around $1.7 billion. However, that market capitalization has fallen significantly since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Prior to the war starting, the market cap was somewhere in the region of $2.5 billion. And the Unipro business in Russia operates five power plants. The largest of these, which is located in the center of Russia, is a gas power plant that has an installed capacity of 5.6 gigawatts. The second largest of these is a coal-fired power station that has an installed capacity of 2.4 gigawatts. The third largest is in Moscow and has an installed capacity of 1.5 gigawatts. The fourth largest is a combined gas and coal power station that has an installed capacity of 1 gigawatt. And the fifth largest is another gas and coal combined facility that has an installed capacity of 630 megawatts. The total installed capacity equates to around 5% of Russia's total energy requirements. And the company employs 4,500 people in Russia. This presentation on the company's website show the financial results to the period up to November 2022. And as you can see, the company has actually been performing very well. EBITDA in the first nine months of 2022 was 32 billion rubles, which represents a significant uplift on the 22 billion in the nine months of 2021. EBIT was up to 26 billion rubles, a 10 billion increase from the 16 billion in 2021. And underlying net income was up to 21 billion rubles compared to 13 billion last year. However, one of the important issues here, and I think this is related to the takeover and the decree that's been announced, is that CAPEX, so capital expenditure, investment into new plants and equipment, is down to 3 billion rubles compared to 7 billion rubles in 2021. And this large reduction in CAPEX relates directly to Uniper's statement that it will not be investing any further capital into Russia whilst the conflict in Ukraine is continuing. And if we move on to this chart, it shows the KPIs or the key performance indicators for the five power plants that are operated by Unipro. And if we look over at this section on the right hand side, which shows the amount of terawatt hours produced in terms of electricity in 2022 versus 2021, you can see that for four out of the five power stations, the amount of power that's been produced in 22 is more than it was in 2021. So we've got an uplift here from 20.7 to 22, from 2.7 to 7.8, so significant uplift, from 4.4 to 5, and 3.3 to 3.7. There's only one power station, which is the smallest out of all five of them, where output has fallen from 1.5 to 1.1. But in total, the amount of energy produced was 39.7 versus 32.6 in the previous year. So in terms of performance and what these power plants are actually producing, year on year, they've increased their output. So from that perspective, there can't really be any complaints. President Putin definitely 
definitely can't accuse Uniper of pulling back from its obligations in terms of producing power for the Russian people and businesses because year on year power production is up. Now this table shows the issued share capital for Unipro. And the reason I wanted to show this was really to highlight the fact that Uniper owns 83.7% of all of the shares. And that represents a significant majority. So although the shares are technically listed on the Moscow Stock Exchange, so Russian individuals can buy shares in Unipro, actually in reality, this is a subsidiary business of Uniper. And the main reason that the company remains listed is that the Russian authorities wanted it to remain on the Moscow Stock Exchange. In terms of Uniper's official stance with regards to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Uniper announced that it is focused on its role as a shareholder and neither invests in Russia nor supports Unipro's activities financially. Uniper has decided to further distance itself as far as possible legally and in terms of personnel from its Russian business unit Unipro in which Uniper holds 83.73%. Unipro has been for sale since the summer of 2021 and a transaction was agreed with a local buyer. However, the political approval of the transaction is pending and uncertain. And the official page on the company's website states that we will terminate our activities in Russia as quickly as possible. So the message is very clear that Uniper doesn't want to be involved in Russia, but clearly it doesn't want to walk away, firstly, from its obligations and commitments, and secondly, from its financial investment into the Russian business. Now, in terms of the financial position of Uniper, I think it's really interesting that one of the knock-on implications of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is that Uniper had to be bailed out by the German authorities. Uniper is the business that buys and supplies gas to the German market, and the biggest supplier of gas to Uniper was Russia. So Uniper was the biggest single beneficiary of the Nord Stream gas pipelines. And of course, what happened over the course of the first six months or so of the Ukraine war was that the amount of gas being provided from Russia to Germany fell dramatically. It reduced to around 40% of the historic levels. And then when the Nord Stream pipelines were bombed, obviously all of that supply stopped overnight. And what that did is put an enormous amount of financial pressure onto Uniper because it had its long-term supply agreement with Russia. So it was expecting to receive billions of cubic meters of gas. However, that gas stopped flowing. And because Uniper had an obligation to keep supplying gas to the Russian consumers and industry, it had to go into the international markets and buy gas at a time when gas prices had increased by around 400%. Now, under the terms of the contracts that it had in place, Uniper wasn't able to pass on those cost increases to German consumers, and therefore its bottom line fell through the floor. It announced huge losses, it had a liquidity crisis, and the German authorities had to step in and provide a $15 billion bailout. Now, interestingly, the Finnish business Fortum that we're going to come on to talk about in a moment actually owns 80% of Uniper, but as part of the bailout deal, the German government took a 30% stake and Fortum's stake was reduced to 56%. So the overall impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on Uniper has been disastrous. It caused the business to almost go bankrupt in Germany, effectively led to it being nationalized and bailed out by the German authorities, and now it's lost control of all of its Russian businesses as well. Fortum is a major energy business based in Finland that has been growing over the last 20 to 30 years through acquisitions and expansion overseas. And as part of that expansion, Fortum owned seven thermal power plants in Russia. In 2007, Fortum acquired a 26% stake in the Russian power plants and in the following year increased that to 100% ownership. These power plants have a total generation capacity of 4.7 gigawatts and a heat production capacity of 7.6 gigawatts. Six plants produce electricity and heat for the market, while one produces only electricity. In addition to the power plants that Fortum operates, it also has a joint venture in Russia with a portfolio of 3.4 gigawatts of wind and solar plants. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Fortum announced that it had stopped all new investment projects in Russia and would not be providing any new financing to its Russian subsidiaries. In May 2022, the company announced that it was preparing a controlled exit from the Russian market with potential divestments of the Russian operation as the preferred path. 
They also made a decision to replace all Russian fuels with other fuels in all of its other business interests. As I mentioned at the start of the video, a lot of businesses at the start of the Ukraine conflict announced that they were walking away from their investments in Russia. And some of these investments were huge. So let's have a look at which companies incurred the biggest losses as part of writing off all of that investment. BP is the company that has incurred the single biggest loss as part of their full exit out of Russia and declared a write down of $24 billion relating to its stakes in Rosneft and two other joint ventures in Russia. The company that's incurred the second biggest loss in the world is the French business Total Energies and has recorded impairment costs of $10.7 billion. Shell, which is the world's largest trader of liquefied natural gas, and had been involved in a joint venture facility on the island of Sakhalin with Russia, have written off $5 billion of investment as a result of their decision to fully exit from Russia. ExxonMobil, the giant US oil business, was one of the first to develop a joint venture in Russia and has disclosed a $3.4 billion write-down relating to its full exit from the country. OMV, the Austrian energy business, has taken a 2 billion euro hit on its decision to exit. The Norwegian business Equinor has shut all its facilities, incurring a loss of 1.1 billion. And Enel, the Italian utility business, sold its 56% stake in Enel Russia for around 137 million euros, incurring a loss of 1.3 billion euros. The French bank Society Generale had the largest exposure as a result of its ownership of Russian bank Rosbank. Directly following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Sokgen started the process of selling this stake and it was sold to a Russian oligarch and Sokgen incurred a loss of 3.2 billion euros on the deal. Italian bank Unicredit had the second largest exposure to the Russian market and so far has booked a 1.3 billion euro loss relating to all of the loans that it currently has out to Russian companies and individuals. French bank Credit Agricole had the third largest exposure and has taken a hit of 500 million euros. Austrian bank Rafeson International had a variety of branches and so far has taken a hit of 301 million euros. Italian insurer Generali also had large exposure and so far has taken a hit of 138 million euros. American bank Citigroup had developed a commercial and consumer banking business in Russia over the course of the last 20 years and so far has incurred charges of $170 million relating to that exposure. And Swiss banking giant UBS has so far written off $100 million and so far has reduced its loan exposure from $600 million to $400 million. Over the last 20 years or so, McDonald's have built an extensive network of stores in Russia. However, McDonald's has taken the decision to exit entirely from Russia and has sold all of its stores to a Russian business who has had to rebrand it and is not allowed to use the McDonald's name. And as part of that deal, McDonald's have incurred a loss of $1.4 billion. AB InBev, the large Belgian brewer, had a non-controlling stake in a Russian joint venture and has written off $1.1 billion as part of its exit. The Danish brewer Carlsberg had set up its own facilities in Russia and was one of the biggest brewers in the country and has incurred a write-down of $1.3 billion as part of its exit. French food company Danone had set up a dairy business in the country and has written off a billion euros as part of its decision to leave. US tobacco giant Philip Morris has discontinued sales of a number of Marlboro and Parliament cigarette products in Russia and has taken a hit of over $1 billion. Henkel, the makers of a number of consumer products, including Persil washing detergent and Prick Glue, has also incurred a write-off of 1 billion euros as part of its exit from the country. French car maker Renault had set up its own facilities in Russia and also had a majority stake in Russia's biggest car maker, Autovaz. As a result of the invasion of Ukraine, Renault has now exited from the country and sold its stake in Autovaz for 1 ruble, incurring a loss of 867 million euros in the year. Nissan, the Japanese car company, had also set up facilities in Russia. However, they have now sold this for 1 euro to a Russian state-owned entity, incurring a loss of $687 million. Volkswagen, the German car business, had set up a truck division under its Trayton brand and have now disposed of this, incurring a loss of 550 million euros. Volvo, the Swedish car manufacturer, has suspended all of its activities and set aside provisions of $423 million. And finally, the US car manufacturer Ford, which actually has two large manufacturing facilities in Russia and quite a large business, hasn't actually decided to exit from Russia yet. It's only suspended its operations as it stands currently. And so far, they have only taken a $122 million write down, which is obviously considerably less than the other car manufacturers. However, if they do decide to exit, then this sum is likely to increase considerably. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, 
Yale School of Management have been keeping a comprehensive list of the actions of companies from the West with regards to their business interests in Russia. And these business interests range from companies that had subsidiary entities, so employees and factories and various facilities on the ground in Russia, right through to businesses that simply have a trading relationship. And you can check this out on the Yale School of Management website. There is a very long list of companies. We scroll down to the bottom. This shows the companies that have left Russia entirely. So these were the businesses that decided that they no longer wanted to have any sort of involvement whatsoever from the day one. And you can see that currently this list of companies that have cut all ties with Russia accounts to 521 companies. And there are some major companies on this list. If we continue scrolling up, we then have the next category of companies. And these are the companies that suspended all of their operations following the start of the war. They haven't stated that they're exiting Russia forever. They're just saying that they're putting everything on hold. And as it stands at the moment, there are 503 companies in this category. If we carry on further up on the list, we now come to the companies that are reducing their current operations. So they're not suspending, they're not exiting, they're just cutting back. And there are 149 companies in this category. If we now carry on further up the list, we come to the companies that are holding off on new investments and new developments. So they're carrying on trading, but they won't be putting any new money in. They're not looking to expand their businesses, to hire people, to build a bigger business in Russia. They're just looking to carry on as they are. And currently there are 176 companies in this category. And if we now carry on to the top of the list, these are the companies that are carrying on as normal, as if the invasion never happened. And interestingly, there are 232 companies on this list. And the countries that these companies are from include lots of companies from Europe and the United States. So I'll scroll back through here. You can see we've got Germany, Italy, France, the United States, United Kingdom, Denmark, and a whole host of other countries who are against what's happening in Ukraine. Now, the reason that I wanted to show you this list is that all of these businesses and all of these assets are potentially at risk. What we've seen from today's video is that President Putin has decided that even though Uniper and Fortum were continuing to operate the Russian entities as normal, in fact, we saw from the Uniper figures that actually the amount of electricity being produced had increased in 2022. So they'd actually been expanding the business Despite that, he's decided that Russia needs to take control of that business. And of course, what that means is that all companies that are continuing to operate in Russia run the same risk. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video really to share with you the latest developments in terms of what's happening in the business world in Russia. And what we've seen from today's video is that two major energy businesses, both of whom have been significantly affected by what's happened in Russia, Uniper actually has been nationalized as a result of not getting enough gas from Russia under the contracts that were in place prior to the war starting. But not only has it been nationalized, it's now lost control of all of its Russian subsidiaries. So this has really been a rough ride from Uniper's perspective. And from Fortum's point of view, it's also been devastating because Fortum owns Uniper. Prior to the nationalization, it actually owned around 80%. That ownership is now down to 56%. So it's lost value in terms of its investment in Uniper, but it's also now losing value in terms of all of its investment into Russia that it's been making since 2007. And as we've discussed in today's video, there really isn't a lot of logic behind President Putin's decision to step in and take over both of these businesses. Uniper and Fortum have been carrying on with their obligations. They've continued to deliver power to the Russian markets over the course of the last 12 months or so. And in fact, as we saw from the data, the power generation has actually increased during that time. So there can't really be any complaints from the Russian authorities' perspective in terms of performance. But really what's causing the problem here is the decision by both of these businesses not to invest any further. Russia wants to expand its capabilities. It wants overseas businesses to put money directly into the economy. That's why Russia has been inviting companies in for the last 30 years. So as soon as President Putin hears that overseas companies are no longer prepared to spend and invest into Russia, 
that's raising a red flag. And what he's done here is stepped in and taken over some highly valuable assets. Apart from the troubles that Uniper encountered with regards to its gas supplies, energy generation has actually been a very lucrative sector to be in over the course of the last year or so, because we've seen energy prices rising dramatically. And in most cases, those price rises have been passed on to consumers. So we, the consumers, have been bearing the brunt of what's been going on. And the energy companies, generally speaking, have been making super profits. So this is a great sector to be in. And President Putin has decided that now is the right time to step in and take over control of these Russian assets. So obviously that's good news for Russia and bad news for Uniper and Fortum. But the bigger picture perspective here is more concerning because as we've seen from today's video, there are hundreds and hundreds of companies that are continuing to trade in Russia. And the risk that those businesses are running is that if Russia decides that those businesses look attractive and profitable and something that would benefit the Russian state, then there is every possibility that Russia could declare more decrees and take over more businesses, particularly if they're owned by companies that are located in what Russia describes as unfriendly countries, i.e. countries that are applying sanctions against Russia. As we saw earlier in the video, the direct impact on Western businesses of Russia's invasion of Ukraine has equated to the loss of around $1 trillion worth of investments. So that means that all of those companies that had taken time, money, effort and people to invest into Russia have lost all of that investment forever. So that's obviously bad news for those companies and potentially for the global economy. And you might expect that that means that there's a trillion dollar benefit from Russia's perspective. However, it doesn't really work like that because if you're talking about multinational businesses, something like vehicle production, where you've got components being made in countries all across the world and those components are then transferred around to get the final finished product. Just because Russia takes over a car production plant doesn't mean that it can carry on producing those vehicles because it no longer has access to a variety of those components, including quite importantly, some of the microchips that are needed for those vehicles. So what we've seen is Russia has been taking over some of these assets, but actually it hasn't been able to carry on production because there's been supply issues or potentially some technology issues that they haven't been able to get around. So the bottom line here is that the loss of these businesses in Russia has been damaging to the global economy. It has had a large impact on a variety of multinational businesses over the course of the last 12 months, but it's had a bigger impact on the Russian economy. The details of today's video where Russia is taking over these power plants will probably be beneficial to Russia overall because they'll now be able to have all of that income. But when you take a step back and look at the bigger picture, because Russia has lost its trading relationships and its supply agreements with a lot of businesses from the West, that's had a damaging impact on the Russian economy at the same time as Russia has seen over 1.2 million people, some of which are its most skilled and highly educated leave the country forever. So the longer lasting impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine is more damaging on the Russian economy than it will be on the global economy. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's episode, you found it interesting, informative and thought provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up and here's something to put a smile on your face.